the best topics on which i could expect kirtan sir to speak on and we all know him right he he has been a padma shri awardee he he has been teacher of various teachers who have taught all of us so that's how big he is i don't think any words would be sufficient enough to introduce him so let me just rather keep shut and we straight away start with sir's presentation and i hope the audio visual does not give us that much of a trouble so that's keeping fingers crossed on that sir if you could go to your screen slide show that would be better of all and dr deepak dalmi has also joined in and is waiting to hear from you so hi deepak how are you yeah deepak i have been trying to contact you on the phone so we'll talk later okay over to okay, you shall i start yes sir please okay let me hide this go to options uh, or view options options or does it no oh, sorry view view right and auto hide yeah Okay, so uh, how do I get myself off the screen and the slides to come on now? Okay. So I can we can see everything. Yeah. Right. You know, first of all, uh, welcome. I hope all of you are keeping safe, staying safe, and uh, the topic today. that i chose was when monish gave me a call and said sir we want you to talk to something on the post graduates and i said look i am locked up at home all my materials are in the hospital and there is no way i can access it so i really don't know i have no slides nothing to talk on and he said why don't you talk on vertigo because you know that's something that uh, was my first love as he said i started working on vertigo nystagmography way back in 1970 71 it's a long time ago and vertigo by itself is a huge huge topic you can't really uh, cover that let's be a little more specific so i said monish is it okay if we talk on uh, peripheral vertigo so he said fine then i realized even in peripheral vertigo there are so many different disorders and we said we'll zoom down so i'll give you a little preamble about vertigo and uh, hope that you don't get too bored with it and then we'll try and see what is the current status of what constitutes venereal disease how do you diagnose it what is the accepted line of treatment uh monish was suggesting we could have questions in between but if it gets too dragging interrupt me we'll have questions otherwise we can finish the lecture and then have the questions okay okay so start off now this is what vertigo means to me especially when i'm finishing my clinic late at night 10 o'clock and the last patient comes and sits in front of you and says doctor i've got vertigo now why is that why why do you feel that disaster impending disaster when that happens and that's because this is a little peculiar complaint this is a disease where the history is very weak the clinical examination doesn't give you anything very often the investigations all come normal and you after the investigations tell the patient everything is normal and the patient says but doctor i am feeling dizzy the diagnosis can be vexing because all your tests tell you where the problem could be in the periphery or the center but rarely do they tell you what the problem is and the treatment all of you know how confusion can get so as far as the history is concerned the reason why i say it's weak you know imagine a patient comes to you and says doctor i'm bleeding from my left nostril you know exactly what's happening to him but when a patient comes and says i have got vertigo he may describe it according to his educational background socio economic ethnic background chakkar chakri dizziness all sorts of different sensations and very often he comes and says i have got vertigo as if it's like the most fatal disease that he's got is so scared now the point is if you dwell on this symptom for a little while and try to get him to explain to you exactly what is happening quite often it comes out that there is no vertigo there is no sensation of movement maybe he's feeling a little uncertain in his head or he's feeling a little unsteady or mental confusion but he will come and tell you chakkar aata hai ya there is vertigo so you have to spend a little time and the problem here again is that if you ask this patient to tell you what's happening he will start with sir 20 years ago etc etc and the history just goes on and on 
And if you've got a busy OPD or a busy practice with patients waiting outside, you're losing your patients. Somebody had done a study and said, how much time before a doctor interrupts a patient giving history? And they found that the average time was 37 seconds. So in order to avoid that kind of a situation with you, what we advise for a patient of vertigo is to have a history sheet. So when a patient comes to you and says, doctor, I've got vertigo, is it fine? You ask a few questions, three or four, to make sure that, yes, he's got a genuine problem. And then you say, fine, here is the sheet. Please sit in the corner in the waiting room and fill out the sheet. Now, if you see the sheet, may not be able to very clearly read it because the letters are small, but you've got the nature of vertigo, swaying, light-headed, turning, falling, blackouts. Now, this is not going to help you make a diagnosis, but by defining the exact sensation, you're really understanding whether the patient actually has a movement disorder or not, where he feels movement when there is no movement taking place. Sometimes they say it's only uncertain, heaviness in the head, something happening in the head, and then you know that you may not be dealing with vertigo at all. So you define the symptom not for diagnosis, but to see how certain the patient has a complaint. The accompanying vegetative symptoms give you a clue, sweating, nausea, nausea vomiting with the... Uh, complaint of vertigo could point to a peripheral thing. You look for a trigger mechanism which might be setting off the attack. If there is a definite trigger, then you know it rules out many years disease for you. You ask for the duration of a single attack and if he says just a few seconds, you know it can't be many years. If he says the vertigo goes on continuously all through the day for the last one week, I'm feeling dizzy, then you know that you could be dealing with something vestibular neuronitis or something of that sort. So you are getting clues as to which direction to move in. Along with the history of his deafness, his vertigo, his associated symptoms, you also ask him for symptoms of other cranial nerves involved. Smell, taste, ear symptoms, tinnitus, deafness, fullness, whether any surgery was done on the ear, taste disorders, trigeminal nerve, 9, 10, 11, 12 nerves. So you go through a complete cranial nerve scan in history, ask for a history of head and neck trauma, very often the patient might have had a minor fall, which he doesn't mention to you. And six weeks later, he's coming to you with a post-head injury vertigo. Ask for any neurological symptoms, any cardiovascular history, for example, blood pressure, atherosclerosis, myocardial infarction, stenting done, CABG, history of diabetes, what drugs he is using. Now, the point I'm trying to make over here is that when the patient is talking to you, he may mention to you what he thinks is important and a lot of these would get uncovered. While if you give him this sheet, there are three distinct advantages. The patient ticks off certain points. So when he comes to you, you know exactly what points you want to dilate on and spend time on. You don't waste your time asking and listening to unnecessary things. The second thing is you have saved your time, but you have ensured that every question got asked Sometimes I've had patients who forget to mention that they had taken streptomycin injection or that they are on oral contraceptives, which can lead to a little uh, labyrinthine high drops. So every question has got asked. You have saved time. And lastly, in medical legal cases, this comes in handy because I had a case where a patient came to me, severe vertigo, many years disease. He was a car driver for a company. So I had to give him leave. He took leave for three months. After that, the company wanted to tell him that you can't work anymore because you uh, obviously are not fit to drive. So he said, no, no, I don't have giddiness. And I was called to the court of law to depose before the case. And I could take out my paper and say, look, he saw me on so-and-so date, and these are the symptoms he had that time, and these were my findings. So for medical legal cases, it becomes an important document. So guys, history is king. And believe me, if you spend time with a vertigo patient taking a proper history, 80% of your diagnosis would be made. Then your investigations would be more in the direction given to you by the history to confirm or rule out certain things. But the history alone in a vertigo patient taken properly will often guide you to the diagnosis. The second thing is clinical exam. Now, usually in these patients, the clinical ENT examination is normal. But just doing a clinical ENT examination and tuning fork, would that be sufficient? Actually not, because you realize that vertigo is not just related. We know that balance is maintained with 
inputs coming from the eyes, from proprioception, from the semicircular canals, from the spinal cord. And these impulses coming to the brain are coordinated for the patient to react and maintain balance. And these brain brainstem reflexes are further controlled by central structures like the thalamus, by temporal lobes, by the cerebellum to a great extent. So you need to be aware that even these things need to be asked of and quickly tested when you're doing a clinical examination of a vertigo patient. So not only ENT, but you do a neurological examination, take his blood pressure, pulse. Uh, we also know that patients with thyroid disorders, cardiac problems, diabetes, so have to look into these investigations as well. So you are suddenly having to cover a much broader field. Now, they say the eyes are the window to the vestibular system. The nystagmus will tell you a lot. You want to look for spontaneous nystagmus, gaze nystagmus, head shaking nystagmus, positional nystagmus. And you can even try to do a, not VHIT, but a head impulse test in the OPD. If you are looking for nystagmus, if you can do it with Frenzel's glasses or the Stroop's glasses, or if you're really blessed with a good VNG setup, you will catch much more nystagmus than looking directly at the patient's eye. Because when you're looking at the patient's eye, the patient is looking at your face and he's fixating. So this fixation, gaze fixation that happens, very often suppresses a very mild nystagmus that might be there. And this is the reason why Frenzel's glasses or VNG become important. So if you can't afford a VNG, get yourself a Frenzel's glasses or a Stroop's glasses and you should be able to uh, see fine nystagmus as well. You can do positional testing, and again, this, if done with Frenzel's glasses or with VH, with uh, video nystagmography, will give you better results. Now, you do a clinical examination. As I said, you also do a quick neurological, cranial nerves, look motor, sensory functions. We do some quick cerebellar testing. We ask the patient to do a Romberg test, walking on floor test. This is clinical examination. Then you go to investigations which can be targeted once you've got a proper history and clinical examination done. But we will stick ourselves to two main things as ENT. One is audiometry and one is the vestibular testing. Now, the reason why I've got this audiogram for you over here is that when you do audiometry, you know that you have to test at the correct frequencies. You can't test just 250 or 250 and 500 and say, I think the patient's hearing is normal. Similarly, when you do the vestibular testing, the vestibular system also needs to be tested at certain frequencies. Unfortunately, whatever tests that we have at the vestibular system level right now, caloric tests, rotation tests, are of much low sensitivity and specificity because they are testing at the wrong frequency. They say you should be testing between uh, 1 to 10 hertz frequency for vestibular testing while your caloric test is something like 0.1 hertz and uh, the rotation test is a little better. Now with the head impulse test, I think things are getting more and more clear. The other fallacy is that many of our tests formerly were directed towards the lateral semicircular canal. The caloric test, the rotation test were all tests of the lateral semicircular canal. While we know that there are five end organs, there are three canals and two uh, autolytic organs and any of these could be at fault and give you the problem so even if your caloric test came normal it didn't mean that the vestibular system was normal as we thought it was diagnosis becomes a big problem as i test all these tests tell you whether it's a peripheral vertigo or a central vertigo but it doesn't really tell you the etiological agent now when i was at kem we ran a, a vertigo clinic there and over the years that I've been there, I mean, I was there for almost something like 30 years. We had a database of about 10,000 patients and we had detailed notes on this. So not only the vestibular diagnosis, but the associated conditions that the patient had. And I wrote a book in 1981 on electronystemography. And there I had all the diagnosis or the, all the conditions associated with vertigo or conditions that could present as vertigo. I'm just showing you the picture of one page from there. You can see all these conditions and there are four or five such pages there. You can imagine how many different conditions are there that could present with vertigo. So that's a huge task in front of you because if you want to treat the underlying disorder that caused the vertigo, 
you'll have to come to this diagnosis. And treatment of vertigo, the less said, the better. I don't think there is any symptom in the human body for which you have as varied a treatment. I think there is as many treatments as there are doctors. Look at that. You know, you have diuretics, vasodilators, vasoconstrictors, cholinergics, anticholinergics, sedatives, anesthetic agents, endocrine therapy, physical, psycho, hyperbaric oxygen. And sometimes people put everything together and give it like a shotgun therapy, hoping that something would work. Here, actually, this is a slide from Kenya that I got, which is jungle remedies for vertigo. People are talking about yoga. And of course, there are other medic medications that people turn to. But all this only tells you one thing, that people don't know what exactly they are treating. And usually what they do is when a patient comes to them, they see what patient has not taken so far. Or you have not taken this, try this. That's how the treatment goes. Or if a patient comes to ENT, he'll say, oh, but I think you've got a cardiac problem. Go to the physician. Have you seen a neurologist? Go to the neurologist. The neurologist will say everything is okay. Just have a good eye examination done. And it just goes orthopedic for cervical spine. So the patient gets shunted from place to place. When we started a vertigo clinic, we had all these specialists, the neurologists, the audiologists, the psychiatrists, the ENT, all sitting together in one clinic. The patient didn't have to go anywhere. The physicians came together. And believe me, the number of patients who got relief because of this joint clinic was really amazing. So this shotgun therapy is not the way to go. So it becomes a big question. What would be the right way to treat these patients? Now, in this slide, can you see where the patient is? Can you tell me which one is the patient? I think you may not be able to guess that, but the patient is here. You see this football? And that's the halat of the patient when he comes to the doctor for his vertigo because he gets shunted, as I said, from the ENT to the orthopedics for spondylosis, from orthopedic to neurology, neurology to cardiology. And if you really want to treat your patients well, start a vertigo clinic where the patient doesn't have to go everywhere, but the physicians all come together for that one hour or two hours a week to treat your patients and you'll get amazing results. So if you think I'm going to solve all these questions for you today and give you the answer, I think you're mistaken. I'm going to narrow down. These are four of the commonest diagnoses that you have in peripheral vertigo. And if you were to talk of all these, I could talk for the whole day and not really come to any conclusion. So I have decided today, and I, I took our uh, organizing chairman's permission. Monish said, okay, sir, you can talk on many years disease. So let's talk on many years disease. What are the current concept? What is acceptable? What is the line of treatment? What are the investigations to be done? All that glitters is not gold and all that spins is not many years disease. You know, in the 80s and 90s, many years disease was used by the physicians, family physicians, neurologists as a waste paper basket diagnosis. The patient had vertigo, you did not, patient wanted some label to give into the disease and they would say, oh, you've got many years disease and the patient went back happy thinking that a diagnosis had been made. Today, Many years has been displaced by BPPV. And I see diagnosis of BPPV on paper and I ask the patient, did they make you lie down and do the test? No. They just examined me, just did some neurological examination and said, you got BPPV. So this has become today's waste paper basket diagnosis. So let's try and define many years disease a little better. It all started this story with this man, Prosper Menier, who was an otologist in France. As you can see, it was in 1861 that he described what is today called Menier's disease, and the poor guy died in 1862. What he basically did was he referred to the earlier work of Florence, and uh, he presented a group of patients at the uh, Parisian meeting saying that vertigo in these patients, as was the practice at that time, it was thought that it is a brain problem, commotio cerebri, a problem in the brain. And many years said, no, it's not a brain problem. Vertigo very often can be a problem in the ear. And he presented this and then he published this in the Medical Gazette, French one, in 1861. 
and at that time luckily he got this uh, young girl patient who had met with an accident she had a head injury she had complained of severe vertigo unfortunately the injury was severe enough for not to allow her to survive when she died and when they did the post mortem they found blood in the inner ear which further confirmed his theory that damage to the inner ear is what's producing the vertigo and not a brain disease as were thought earlier now he didn't call it his disease or meniere's disease so if you look at the historical aspects he referred to the work of florence in 1830 who worked on semicircular canals of pigeons and he did experiments on ablation of pigeon semicircular canals and showed that the pigeon was losing balance so florence had already suggested that semicircular canals are connected with balance many are confirmed that with his sort of theory of vestibular system and the girl's post mortem findings and it was a man called duplay who 11 years later at a conference coined this term malady the menier or what we call as menier's disease 1938 was a very significant year because uh, dr crow was an otologist in the us who i know that dr jody sam my boss worked with described for first time the fluctuating hearing loss in menier's disease and then holpike and cairns and yamakawa and i'm going to mark them in red because i'll tell you how they have contributed to the understanding of menier's disease now what is surprising is that it was holpike and cairns in 1938 who published in the jlo the article with post mortem findings of a patient of menier's disease showing high drops in the labyrinth and it was for the first time that the theory of labyrinthine high drops for menier's disease was formulated and people understood at that time what is the pathophysiology of menier's disease 1938 but look at the person below there george portman george portman in 1927 had already described in bordeaux in france an operation of endolymphatic sac decompression 11 years before holpike and kens showed that the disease was caused by hydrops so there's hydrops that's the endolymphatic sac the endolymph drains through the endolymphatic duct into the sac and then through this pachyonian bodies empties into the sinus so this is the drainage system of the endolymph and the endolymphatic sac is supposed to get dilated because the pressure in the labyrinth goes up and this is the sac that they want to decompress of course understand that it's not uh, the sac is situated not just in the temporal bone but it is in a dural fold lying very close to the medial aspect of the temporal bone it's between a fold of dura so that is why you have to open the outer layer of dura to decompress the sac imagine the genius of the man portman he described it 11 years before holpike and kens described the disease so many as disease as people understood was a disease of episodic vertigo fluctuating hearing loss tinnitus and sometimes associated with nausea and vomiting this was the classical description but now we also know we add to this the fact that if many as disease has been present for a certain length of time then even without an acute attack the patients may have a little bit of postural instability and some gait problem the patient sometimes says you know while walking sometimes i miss a step i am not as sure footed as i was earlier even if i don't have the attack and the other thing in many as disease is drop attacks or tumarkin crisis we'll talk about that a little later where a patient just drops to the ground uh, suddenly because of lack of tone of the postural muscles and this is the pathologic correlate over there high drops in the endolymphatic system is what is thought to cause many as disease now i'm going to tell you a little story here about holpike and kens they are the ones who described um, high drops La Holpike was a very famous neurotologist Charles Kenneth Holpike in the UK and Hugh Cairns was a young neurosurgeon from UK who went across to America and studied with uh, Dr Cushing was a very famous neurosurgeon came back learning the technique of selective vestibular nerve section through the posterior fossa 
So he must have gone to Hall Pike and said, and remember there was no beta histin, vertin, suzeron at that time. So he said, what do you do for your patients of many years? There's nothing you can do. I can cure them. I can do a selective vestibular urectomy without damaging their hearing. So they operated on two patients. Unfortunately, the patient died. But instead of lose, losing a heart and getting disappointed just by the defeat, these two gentlemen went to the post-mortem room, harvested the temporal bone, took sections, and were able to show that the patient had endolymphatic high drops. And that's how it came to be understood that, so out of defeat, out of something going wrong and the patient losing his life, at least the pathology of endolymphatic high drops in many years disease came to light. This was 1938, almost 60 years or 70 years after Menier described the disease. Now, it was Holpike, as I said, who described it in 1938. At the other end of the world, in Japan, where there was no communication between the two, Yamakawa, also in 1938, exactly the same year, published in the Japanese Journal of ENT or Medicine, his findings in a patient of vertigo with Menier's disease. And they say that if you compare the pictures of the two, the histopathology pictures of the two, they seem almost identical. So it's a great coincidence that after 60, 65 years, in the same calendar year, two people completely thousands of miles apart realized what was causing Menier's disease. In short, they said, you have the endolymphatic system and this tends to swell up. And that is what produces the symptoms of Menier's disease. Of course, this slide is a little bit wrong because the cochlea gets affected first. And it's not the basal turn of the cochlea that gets affected first, but it's the apical turn of the cochlea that tends to get affected first, giving rise to the typical low tone hearing loss. Now comes the problem. In the uh, European archives, you have this article by Magna Nethal. This is a European paper on. Uh, uh, many years disease and they said that people have reported that in temporal bone studies that people do for patients who die for whatever cause in 10 percent of normal subjects meaning people who died of some other cause and who never had a ear problem no vertigo no deafness they had saccular high drops in 10 percent and if the patients whose postmortem was done had sensory neural hearing loss, but no vestibular symptoms in their lifetime. 40% of these patients showed endolymphatic high drops. Also, in Shukhnex laboratory, I had one of my students working there, Dr. Samuel Merchant, who told me and shared this with me, that they have seen temporal bones of patients who died of some other cause, but had classical many years disease in their lifetime. And surprisingly, their temporal bones did not all show high drops. So this is a little confusing. That is high drops the know all and the be all of many years or is there something that we are missing? Okay, so now we are saying that it's a hydropic ear disease that produces many years. But it was Gurkha who said, let's look at this hydropic ear disease a little more in detail and he classified it into two types. He called it the primary hydropic disease, which is idiopathic, which we classically call many years disease. And you have the secondary hydropic ear disease where we can definitely find a cause or an associated disease, which is associated with the high drops. So this he calls shed or secondary hydropic disease, which you cannot label as many years disease because today by definition, many years is essentially idiopathic high drops okay so what is the secondary high drops that we are talking about you can have secondary high drops of the year due to infections syphilis autoimmune disorders like the kogan syndrome autoimmune ear disease neoplasms intralabyrinthine tumors vestibular schwannomas even endolymphatic sac tumors can produce high drops in the labyrinth and this does not constitute many years it may be syndrome, but it is not Menier's disease. To call it Menier's disease, it has to be idiopathic. So it's a disease of the membranous labyrinth, characterized by vertigo, deafness, usually tinnitus, has as its pathologic correlate hydropic distension of the endolymphatic system. And to make it even more specific, 
this is what i have put it's a clinical disorder idiopathic a syndrome of lymphatic high endolymphatic high drops with recurrent spontaneous without a trigger spontaneous attacks of episodic vertigo fluctuating hearing loss this becomes a very important symptom now the oral fullness is an extremely important symptom and i'll explain to you why and tinnitus the episodes of vertigo are not always but usually accompanied by nausea and vomiting and let us try and see why this happens so let's try and explain this symptoms you see a patient gets a sensation of movement when he moves his head because the endolymph moves in the semicircular canals or the autoconia move and they give tending of the hair cells either towards the kinocilium or away from the kinocilium but it is the bending of the cilia the stereocilia and the kinocilia that give the patient's brain the impression that now there is some movement taking place if in many years disease we agree that there is high drops when the patient gets an attack the pressure in the endolymphatic system goes up and it presses on these vestibular end organs this pressure causes the cilia to bend and when the cilia bend one way or the other they send information to the brain that there is movement taking place and if it's a semicircular canal cilia that bend the patient will get a rotative vertigo if it's the autolytic organ which has stimulated he will get a falling sensation so this is why the patient because of increased pressure and the cilia bending gets a sensation of movement which he calls vertigo and it occurs in episodes when the pressure goes up why it goes we don't know why the pressure goes up and that's why we call it idiopathic similarly on the cochlear side when the pressure goes up the functioning of the hair cells is less than ideal so there is hearing loss and when this pressure decreases by whatever mechanism that the body uses to decrease this pressure and the attack goes away the hair cells function a little better so the hearing improves and that is explaining the fluctuating hearing loss now why the oral fullness that's a little confusing because the inner ear does not have sensory fibers but if you accept that when there is fullness the endolymphatic pressure is reflected into the endolymphatic sac which is within the two layers of the dura then the stretching of the sac stretches the dura and the dura has sensory fibers which the patient feels as a pressure in the ear or some patients even say darad hota hai thoda sa i get a dull pain in the head and that is because possibly the stretching of the dura because of the expansion of the endolymphatic sac why the tinnitus we don't know but somebody has given me an explanation i'll just share that with you and why is the episodes usually accompanied by nausea and vomiting because you have the vagal nucleus very close to the vestibular nucleus there is parasympathetic stimulation due to vagal stimulation and not only is there nausea vomiting they often have very severe sweating they have a drop in blood pressure bradycardia and sometimes even cardiac arrhythmias sometimes if the general practitioner is called in home and he takes the blood pressure he finds the blood pressure to be low and he blames hypotension as the cause of the vertigo attack actually it's the other way about the meniere's vertigo attack is what has led to the hypotension because of parasympathetic stimulation now as regards the nausea is concerned somebody gave me this explanation i don't know whether it's correct or not but he said that when you have this kind of a hearing loss the low tone and if you say that these are the hair cells part of the cochlea is affected by the pressure so those hair cells are functioning differently part of the cochlea towards the base is not affected and that is why at the junction of the two because of the difference in the potentials that they are generating you get tinnitus which is characterized by this particular frequency nice explanation i have no clue whether it's correct or not so to describe this vertigo further the vertigo of many years is without a trigger it is spontaneous it's usually rotational it's accompanied by nausea vomiting collapse sweating etc bradycardia hypotension it can sometimes be so severe that the patient just has to lie down is prostrating if at that time you see the patient's eyes you will be able to see a horizontal or rotational nystagmus during the attack but however severe the prostrating the vertigo is there is never a loss of consciousness and there are no neurological associated symptoms which a patient may get with a stroke 
like dysarthria or any neurological deficit. The episode of vertigo in many years characteristically lasts between 20 minutes to 12 hours. And there should be at least two episodes of this 20 minutes to 12 hours for us to label this as many years disease. I repeat 20 minutes to 12 hours to 24 hours and at least two such separate episodes to call it many years disease. The hearing loss may not be apparent when the patient comes to you if he comes very early. But in the later stages, you'll realize that the patient tells you that the hearing loss is fluctuating. It's usually a low tone loss and with every attack, it gets progressive. But the patient may also complain of a little distortion of hearing during the attack. He says it's not clear, there is diplocusis and the loud sounds tend to bother him because there is loudness recruitment. And as the disease progresses, the audiogram will change. He'll get a low tone hearing loss. Later on, it will become flat and much later, it will be the dropping type. As a matter of fact, somebody has classified this into four types. Type one is between or less than 25 dB. Type two or grade two is 25 to 40, grade three, 41 to 70, grade four more than 70. But please note, this has been our experience that very rarely, almost never in many years disease, do you get a complete hearing loss. So if your patient has a complete hearing loss, think this might be something else. So when you do your audiological investigations, you can do pure tone audiometry. You can look for recruitment with standard testing. You can do impedance audiometry, BERA to rule out a retrocochlear cochlear lesion. At one time, ECOG G was a very, very strong investigation, but I don't think too many people do it now. And there were times when we were doing the glycerol test to confirm that this is high drops. It's a fantastic tape, test, but it can get quite uncomfortable for the patient. The vestibular test, besides the clinical testing, we used to electronistipography, now it's VNG. The head impulse test, you can test all the semicircular canals with the head impulses, not just the lateral, but the caloric test will also give you more information. You can do, if you are lucky to have sophisticated equipment, posturography, but otherwise you can do vestibular spinal testing by Rombergs, walking on the floor or the Unterberger test. VEMP also had some amount of importance given to it, but now people feel VEMP is not that uh, important to test. It can tell you the involvement of the superior inferior vestibular nerve separately, but I'll come back to that a little later. People are also now talking about better and better MRI and imaging, but we'll have a look at it that as well. So as I said, in the VNG, you will do a variety of tests. As far as VEMP is concerned, people were doing it. Now VEMP is mainly used to monitor autolith function because you're simulating the saccule state to find out whether you're getting changes in the potentials in the sternomastoid or you're looking at the orbicular socculi. So you are now using it more and more, not for diagnosis of the disease, but to monitor function because it's a very quick test. When you give, say, gentamicin injection and you want to find out, are you successful in reducing the sensitivity of the autolytic organs or not? This test comes in useful. Now, people are talking about imaging. I've come across some papers and they say that, you know, when you do a T2 weighted image, you see the labyrinth nice. You can see sometimes the, the swollen endolymphatic sacs. This is not from a patient of many years. This is a patient of mine who I did a cochlear implant for a Mondini deformity, which is characteristically associated with the cochlear malformation and an swollen endolymphatic duct and sac. But very rarely in many years do you see something as, as swollen as that. If you look at the cochlea, in the T2 weighted image, you see a nice white sort of full fluid there. But they say that if you do with contrast, gadolinium, either you do a intratympanic injection of gadolinium and wait for four hours or, and wait for some time, or you do an IV injection of gadolinium and wait for four hours, then the perilymph will turn white, but the endolymph will be darker and grayer. So as you can show in this particular picture, Analyze the cochlea here, which is completely white. You can see in the apical turn of the cochlea, it's far more gray as compared to the basal turn of the cochlea, indicating that the endolymph is dilated here and there is more endolymphatic fluid here, indicating that this could be many years disease. I think a 
lot of more work needs to be done on this. So is this a must for a diagnosis to do radiology? I think at present the answer is no, but who knows in future it might come in handy. So remember, as I said, history is still king and the maximum amount of time you should spend with this patient after he fills out the sheet is trying to come to a diagnosis or a direction of your investigations doing the history. Now, Meniere's disease itself has been further classified by this man Feo into five, five different types. Five types of Meniere's disease, let's see what they are. He said type one is where you have pure Meniere's like we described it. There is no familial history, no migraine, no autoimmune comorbidity. This is almost half your patients, 53%. Type 2 Meniere's disease is also called the delayed Meniere's disease, where a patient persistently comes to you with episodic vertigo, which uh, sort of uh, with uh, fluctuating hearing loss, and you're wondering whether you're dealing with uh, autoimmunity. The hearing loss quite by months predates the vertigo. So you're treating the patient only for hearing loss. You're not considering manias because there is no vertigo and the vertigo appears later. So this is type two, which is a delayed type of Meniere's disease, only 8%. The third type of Meniere's disease is familial, where more than one member, this is 13%, and it is important to ask for the family history because in future, if you're able to diagnose and subgroup this patient as familial Meniere's disease, the treatment in might lie in genetic engineering treatment. And you might be able to cure this patient completely by the gene therapy. So that's why familial MD is important because they have found genes responsible for patients developing Meniere's disease. Type four is Meniere's disease associated with migraine. We know that migraine is a stress-related disorder. So we could have some association and in such a patient, it would not be sufficient to just try and treat his many years disease, but you would have to treat his migraine as well. And type five is when the many years disease is associated with a diagnosable autoimmune disorder. And therefore the treatment would be directed not towards just the many years disease, but controlling the autoimmune disorder and the patient may automatically get relief from his vertigo. Lermoy syndrome, is one variant which is accepted. Usually the patient who gets an attack says he gets an aura, his tinnitus starts to get worse. The hearing goes down, he feels hearing going down, 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 and then the vertigo starts. In the Lermoy syndrome, surprisingly, a patient with hearing loss says, my hearing gets sharper and my hearing gets better. And when my hearing is at its best, the vertigo comes. And the other variant we have seen is the Tumarkin crisis or the drop attack, where a patient has such a severe attack that he suddenly drops to the ground. I've had such two patients brought to me. One was a friend's father and I was called to their house. And the description given to me was, I was sitting with my wife across the table and suddenly the table came and hit me on the face. And I asked the wife what happened. He says he was sitting there and the next moment he just plonked straight down and his head hit the table. The second patient was brought in from the bus stop by people who were standing there. He said, they're all standing waiting for the bus. And suddenly this man just went flat, fell to the floor. We thought he had a seizure or paralysis attack. He was completely conscious, but he didn't know what had happened. When I asked the patient what happened, the patient said, sir, I was standing and the road came and hit me on the face. It's a sudden loss of postural muscle tone. Maybe it's happening because there is a rupture of the endolymphatic system or whatever. We don't know the exact reason. But this is a known presentation of many years disease. These two, there used to be a cochlear variant and a vestibular variant. These are no longer accepted as diagnosis. The American Academy 95 gave out certain guidelines. And they said that if your patient had the classic symptoms and had one attack when he comes to you, you could say this is a possible many years disease. If the symptoms are there with more than one definite episode, audiometric fluctuating hearing loss, tinnitus, and fullness give a lot of importance to fullness, then it's probable many years disease. If the patient has more than two spontaneous episodes of 20 minutes or longer, audiometrically fluctuating hearing loss, tinnitus, fullness, and other causes are excluded, then it's a definite many years disease. But if you want to say it is certainly many years disease, 
then you have to do post-mortem histo histopathological confirmation. So I think we can do our best and reach to a diagnosis of a definite Meniere's disease in all our patients. But we know what is not Meniere's. If your patient has episodic vertigo, but no hearing loss, no tinnitus, no fullness coming, or he has a single episode which goes on for days together, it's likely to be a, a vestibular neuronitis than Meniere's disease. If he has a bilateral sensorineural hearing loss, symmetrical, progressive, stepwise, probably uh, autoimmune. If he has a bilateral hearing loss, which is greater than 70 dB and a very poor speech discrimination out of proportion to the hearing loss, you may be dealing with the retrocochlear region. Rule out trauma, infection, autoimmunity, and other CNS conditions. It's not many years if the vertigo is prolonged, continuous, or if it's just momentary, it comes only in a certain position. Trigger is when I stand up or when I lie down, then it's more likely to be BPPV. If he has other neurological symptoms and signs, and as I said, cochlear and vestibular variants are no longer accepted. Now the problem is all our clinical tests, our therapy, all our research is diagnosing high drops, treating high drops. So whether it's idiopathic congenital trauma, infection, whatever, it's the dogma of high drops, produces high drops, producing vertigo, deafness, tinnitus, fullness, nausea, vomiting. But as we saw, you can have high drops without any vertigo, 10% of cases. You can have high drops without vertigo if there is deafness. So it's high drops is seen without the vertigo. And we also saw that postmortem studies in patients showed classical many years in lifetime and no high drops. So this is a little confusing. And therefore, is the high drops the ultimate answer? Or is it that idiopathic congenital trauma viral produces some kind of a change in the inner ear, which leads to vertigo, deafness, tinnitus, fullness, nausea, vomiting, and in some patients, also high drops? Maybe the mechanism could be high drops in some patient, but that might be an epiphenomenon occurring because of some other pathology in the labyrinth. For example, something that interrupts the laminar flow of endolymph produces eddy currents in the endolymphatic flow. So this is something that we have to be careful of because the same treatment given to different patients, it works in some for high drops and the same high drops treatment does not work in other patients. If you are called in the acute phase, which is very, very rare, it's usually the family physician who calls. Now we are turning towards treatment. In the acute episode, the thing to do is to reassure the patient, put him to bed, rest, dark room, don't disturb him, steady his head because any movement will worsen the vertigo. If he's vomiting a lot, you might want to start IV fluids. If he's anxious, a little diazepam may work. If he's vomiting a lot, antiemetics. Look for nystagmus to make sure that it is actually an episode of many years disease. Take his BP pulse, make sure that you're not missing out something there. Check his blood sugar if he's a diabetic and quickly on the bedside do a neurological examination and make sure that you're not dealing also with some kind of a cardiac condition which can pre present with giddiness, with vomiting, with sweating, feeling of rotation. And if you just take that as many years disease and miss out a neurological or cardiac case, that will be a big problem. In the quiescent phase, when the patient comes to you, you're going to do the clinical examination, neurological examination, all the tests we talked about, and try to come to a diagnosis. But during the quiescent phase now, what is the treatment which is accepted worldwide or internationally? And that is what we are going to see now. This is not the way we are going to treat our patient. Look for some drug which somebody has not tried as yet, and you say, okay, now why don't you try this drug? We are not going to kick him around like a football from one specialist to the other. So let us see how to rationalize our treatment. Okay. If the patient comes to you, I get attacks, but he's not having an acute attack at that moment. So your first line of management is going to be preventive. And don't get worried by this confused slide. I'll break it up for you. So the first side, you will look for comorbidity. Try to see if the patient also has some kind of an allergy, migraine, autoimmune disorder, familial disorder, because gene therapy can come into play. But if he has the other things, an allergy, migraine, autoimmunity, 
you will con concomitantly treat that because he doesn't have an acute vertigo attack at the moment. So there is no point in trying to give him labyrinthine sedatives, but you will treat the comorbidities. That's one thing. Number two, you look at his diet and there are two definite things which have been advocated. One is caffeine restriction. Caffeine, especially in habitual consumption, people drink tons and tons of coffee during the day, can produce modification in the endolymph volume by its sympathomimetic action. This has been proved and therefore caffeine restriction becomes one thing in lifestyle change and salt restriction is what we have been telling all our patients. Hopefully that also helps them. So in your first line of treatment, you're going to look at comorbidities, change the diet of the patient. Now comes a big controversial thing. Beta histine, vertin, ver, what is CERC, whatever it's available as. It's a H1 antagon, agonist and it's the H3 receptor antagonist. Both these actions release histamine where it's required in the ear and even at the blood brain marrier. So both these actions are supposed to increase the blood supply where it's required intracranially and in the labyrinth without producing peripheral vasodilatation as happens with other like uh, cyclospasmol or complamina would produce peripheral vasodilatation against which beta histin produces vasodilatation where it's required. But there are, it's a divided opinion. In the United States, for example, it's not allowed to prescribe this drink because it is felt that it is of no use at all. So there are some trials that show it's no use. There are some trials that show that it is used. We ourselves had done a trial estimating the blood flow into the uh, cerebellar area using uh, uh, the nuclear medicine fellows help and we found that we were able to show improved blood flow in patients who had problems there using beta histine so we do advocate using it but uh, nauta did a meta-analysis he went through a lot of publications and came to a conclusion that although cannot be said definitely he says all my literature survey suggests that there is some therapeutic benefit as a preventive and he advocated 48 milligrams twice daily for a period of six months i'm saying this is not an acute attack this is as a preventive this is your first line of management also we normally give diuretics to these patients is it really useful there was a cochrane review done by Thirwal and kundu and they said there is absolutely no evidence to support that not in an acute attack but in preventive diuretics whether they really have a role doubtful now if you give this preventive treatment and the patient says look doc it's still not working my still attacks are going on what shall i do then i think the next line the second line of management now if your first line fails diet comorbidities beta histine salt restriction caffeine restriction not working the second thing you could do is go for intratympanic injection of dexamethasone, four milligrams to a milliliter. Again, there are doubtful, there are papers which say no effect. There are some papers that say there is effect. Many papers say there is a short term benefit. But just to tell you how to inject under local anesthesia, what you do is not just inject, you first inject a little local anesthetic. And the first thing to do is make a small puncture in the tympanic membrane anteriorly. And then with your needle and syringe with the DEXA, make a second puncture over the round window area and inject. The idea is that if you were to inject through this without this, you might produce a severe dilatation or a pressure in the middle ear. So you keep on injecting till fluid starts to leak out from this opening. So you know that you've completely filled up the middle ear and you can stop your injection. Let the patient wait there for some period of time, about half an hour to 40 minutes lying supine. So for a sufficient amount of time, the hydrocortidexa stays against the round window membrane and hopefully gets by uh, endocytosis into the, it's sort of transported across the round window membrane into the labyrinth. But as I said, not very strong evidence that it works. Now, if with this also the patient says, my attacks are still coming, doctor, I'm not happy, then you say that if your vertigo is really incapacitating you, we can progress to surgery. And this is now the third line of management. When you say, I'll do surgery, but I will not damage the hearing. 
So the surgery is conservative and this usually consists now, there were various procedures advised by Shuknek that shown one uh, cochleosaculostomy and things like that. But I think today, the third line of management would be if the patient has intractable vertigo, that remains the only indication. I have come across papers which said in many years disease, you can do decompression not for vertigo relief, but also for preventing further hearing loss. I really don't know whether that works. Somebody suggested in children with Mondini defect, if you decompress because the sac is dilated, you dilate the sac, you may be able to prevent further hearing loss. All my patients with Mondini defects now go for a cochlear implant. And somebody had, I one paper I came across in Luetic high drops for intractable vertigo, he had done a sac decompression. There were some papers who said, with my sac decompression, the tinnitus improves, but I don't think anybody would justify relief of tinnitus as an indication for sac surgery. So the only indication now is many years disease with intractable vertigo. Now, in the endolymphatic sac decompression, the steps of surgery would be to do a complete cortical mastoidectomy, expose the lateral semicircular canal in the additus, and expose the posterior semicircular canal and blue line it so that you know the exact direction of the posterior semicircular canal. Then you drop an imaginary line in the line of the lateral semicircular canal, cutting the posterior semicircular canal into two. Then you take the posterior part of the semicircular canal and the sigmoid sinus which you have delineated. And it is between the posterior part of the, post the posterior half of the posterior semicircular canal and the sigmoid sinus that you should be able to find the dural thickening under which the sac lies. So you're never going to get a sac as dilated like this. As I said, this is only in Mondini's that we see it. And now what do you do to this sac? You're hoping that by decompressing this sac, you're going to be able to take off the pressure. So you have a labyrinth which is normal. Now the labyrinth is swollen and you decompress the sac and the labyrinth will return to normal. This is what you're hoping for. You can either open the sac and let it drain out. Sometimes what we used to do was put a little silicon sheet inside the sac so that it didn't close and you had a endolymphatic sac to mastoid shunt. Then people said that's not good enough. Drain it into the CSF. So people said open the sac and through the medial wall of the sac, put a shunt so that the sac drains into the CSF. I found this a little fallacious because very often the CSF pressure might be higher than the endolymph pressure, so the drainage may not be very great. The reverse flow is avoided by having a valve. These are papers that I came across as to what people do with sac. Some people only decompress it. Some people put a vascular flap to enhance it to improve its vascularity, to do revascularization. Some people have said that they go and do a subarachnoid shunt some people do not only a sac, but they completely decompress the sigmoid sinus. Bill Gibson does sac excision, complete excision of the whole sac. And there are people who inject dexamethasone into the sac. Now this tells you that if everybody is claiming the same amount of success rate, are we really doing the, you know, the right thing? And there was this very interesting paper from Thompson and Bretlau, Mirko Toss, who's a very, very strong neurotologic uh, worker. They took patients where they did in half the number of proved or diagnosed many years patient an endolymphatic shunt operation. And in the other half, they did a placebo, only cortical mastoid, nothing else. And after one year, when they assessed the patient, although they had minor differences between the groups, see what they found. The double line tells you, both groups improved significantly and therefore wondering whether it is just a placebo effect and the sac decompression doesn't work because whatever you do to the sac, 66% of patients improve. Now, let's say you've tried the conservative surgery, it doesn't work, and the patient is still incapacitated, getting drop attacks, then you move to the fourth line of management and you don't have to jump to surgery, you are now doing destructive. You are doing ablation of the labyrinth, but today we can luckily do it without surgery we do an intratympanic injection of the gentamicin and again the same technique, make an opening under local anesthesia and inject from the other till the fluid comes out. Keep the patient in that supine position for about 35 to 40 minutes. 
and let him go home. He may complain of a little bit of unsteadiness for some time. Now, the reason behind injecting gentamicin is that it is more vestibulotoxic than cochleotoxic. Therefore, it is felt that you will selectively destroy the vestibular type 1 cells and the neuroepithelium in the vestibular system, hopefully not damaging the cochlea. The patient may have some post-injection vertigo, but it is helped by adaptation exercise. It is temporary. However, you always have to warn the patient that also it is not greatly cochleotoxic, you may get some hearing loss. So I would do it in a patient who has a fairly significant of hearing loss and incapacitating vertigo. The recommended dose is about 25 to 30 milligram per milliliter, and we inject maybe half to three fourths of a cc till it leaks out from this opening. Post injection evaluation is done by symptomatology, number of attacks, by, by hit, by head impulse test, and also by VEM to find out whether the labyrinthine sensitivity is going on or not. If at the end of three to four weeks you find not much relief, you can always repeat the injection. But what we have found is that the most dramatic and best results of the injection come in patients with drop attacks. If that doesn't work, then you go for the final frontier, the fifth line, and that is destructive. You can still try and preserve the hearing by saying, I do a selective vestibular nerve section, and now people are doing it with the endoscope. You just go lateral labyrinthine, make a tiny opening in the dura, put in your endoscope, and under vision, detach the vestibular nerves, but keep the cochlear nerves intact. So selective vestibular neurectomy without actually doing a major neurosurgical procedure endoscopically or the classical lab three canal labyrinthectomy in which case you will destroy the hearing but since you are keeping the cochlea intact you can combine this labyrinthectomy at the same time with a cochlear implant surgery so the patient's hearing can be restored and again the best results with labyrinthectomy we have seen is in the drop attacks the patients really bless you and the incapacitating vertigo patients but a word of caution here before you go to destructive, whether it is intratympanic injection or whether it is cutting somebody's nerve selectively or whether it is labyrinthectomy. Word of caution. You're going to destroy the function of this labyrinth. Fine. The patient then has no fluctuation in the vestibular system and therefore the brain is able to compensate by adjusting to the loss of the labyrinthine sensitivity by central compensatory mechanism. There are various ones. We can discuss that later. In Meniere's disease, your therapy of adaptation exercises was not working because the vestibular function kept on fluctuating. So the brain could not adjust to the fluctuation. By the destructive operation by intratympanic gentamicin or labyrinthine, uh, labyrinthectomy or vestibular nerve section, you have given the patient a stable vestibular loss so the brain can adjust but you do it on one side or you wait long enough eight years nine years and the labyrinth disease burns itself out and the many years disease dies away but the problem is the patient has two labyrinths and this was a reference i got from uh, the house here institute they saw that patients at presentation about 11 percent had bilateral and by the time of six to seven years 23%, one-fourth of your patients of unilateral many years became milateral many years. If the patient, one-fourth of your patients are going to develop bilateral and you already have destroyed one labyrinth, then I don't know what the patient is going to do. He's going to be in a miserable situation. So be very, very cautious when you decide to do a destructive whether it's labyrinthectomy, whether it's nerve section, whether it's intractive. I was shocked when somebody presented at one of the OI meetings. In one calendar year, he had done 250 intratympanic gentamicin injections. The incidence of Meniere's disease in our Vertigo clinic was 8%. So 8 out of 100 patients that you see are Meniere's, 8 to 9. Out of these, 90% respond to medical line of therapy. So one out of 100 patients might demand surgery. For you to do 250 injections, can you see how many patients you would have to see? So I think that's really jumping the gun, finding a new procedure and just going after it. 
So please, because it can be bilateral, be careful, don't jump into surgery. So in summary, I would say history is king. A detailed history will usually give you the diagnosis. A clinical examination is not just ENT vestibular, but you have to do neuro, cardiac, and look at the endocrine system, etc. Do audiological vestibular tests clinically in the laboratory. If you have VNG, and I think if you're a serious vertigo worker, VNG is a must for you now. Imaging has its place, but it's not a must for diagnosing many years disease. It is useful in ruling out central disorders, acoustic tumors, degenerative conditions, etc. So when you do the proper history, you can do investigations only as are relevant. Conservative and rational therapy, stage one, stage two, grade three, and then you can move to the destructive ones. Exercise great caution. Remember that many years can be bilateral, so don't go about destroying somebody's uh, vestibular system at the drop of a hat. And you're wondering what the picture of a camel is doing over here. You've heard that a straw can break a camel's back, but it's usually the last straw. Similarly, what we have seen in vertigo patients as a general and in many years, that a lot of different factors coming together trigger the attack of vertigo. And therefore, when you treat a many years patient, you shouldn't look at just the labyrinth. We should look at all the surrounding comorbidities, stress factors, and advise the patient as a whole and not just for the year. Because you want to see that all those straws that are building up to give him the attacks are also taken care of. And to end in a lighter note, oh, before I end, yes, I've not mentioned anything about psychotherapy because that's a completely different story. I must share this with you. Psychotherapy in many years or any vertigo patient is important because many of these patients suffer from great anxiety, depression, and even phobias. We used to run a vertigo clinic. And as I told you, because our neurologist, audiologist, physiotherapist, ENT, and even the psychiatrist sat with us in the clinic, the patient felt he was being cared for. We used the same medication that were available. And a lot of our patients came back to us regularly and very, of, very often we found that they were much better off. Now in this period, we had 40 patients when Dr. Medicari was with me, I remember three years that he was with me. We had 40 patients who said whatever we did, they did not improve, they were miserable. Now we had the psychiatrist sitting in the OPD and we referred them to him. He took them to one side and did his psychotherapy evaluation and even a little bit of medication. And wonder of wonders, what we could not do, 38 of these 40 patients with the psychiatrist therapy came back smiling and said that vertigo was taken care of. So psychotherapy in vertigo is integrated therapy. You have to consider psychological aspect of vertigo, but I have not taken that into consideration here because if they have genuine psychiatric problems like anxiety, depression, phobia, rather than you practice amateur psychiatry, I think you should refer them to the proper person. And as I said, to end in the lighter one, I'm going to show you two patients who did not come to me for therapy. So this is what happened to them. Thank you very much for a patient listening. And Monish, I think we can go to the questions. OK, sir, perfect. Now, before I start with the questions, sir, thank you very much. It was actually very interesting to hear. Apart from just the clinical parts, I love the historical aspects which you really presented. And it was amazing then, you know, in 1930s, they could dissect a temporal bone so well to see endolipatic hydrops. I still don't think I can even do that even now. So that's something amazing. And and just but you, to but you, really can, you can decompress it. I don't know. <laughs> I've never <laughs> done that. So so we, we so we do we do have Dr. Anirban Biswas also, sir, attending this. And many other people who are really excellent, Anita Bhandari ma'am, Kalyani Mantya ma'am actually, Prakash Munga sir, and Madhuri Mehta ma'am and who else. But I would just unmute Anirban sir because when it comes to this topic, I think this is where we can have a few comments if he really wants to make any. And we would before he makes a, yeah. Before he makes a comment, if I had known that he was attending, I would have shut up and let him do the talking because he's <laughs> boss, boss man as far as vertigo is concerned, not only nationally, he's done us proud. He's put India on the international vertigo map. So 
we really are proud of him. He's absolutely the top guy, not as I said in India, but the world over is respected. And yes, so is Anita. And Anita you... is also. Yeah, yeah. So she is also here. And let me also thank LKM Arise for you know giving this opportunity to bring us all together. So for the questions, sir, I'll just start with the basic questions first, and then we go to signs and symptoms, and then the treatment planning. Right. Yeah. So we have still about twenty minutes at hand. I think we should be able to cover up and try to filter those as many as we can. One is by mm -hmm. the time we ask these questions, if you could share the screen of your history taking protocol, right? People really want to see that again. So you can just share that while we continue with the questions, sir. Okay. Now, Hafsa, Doctor Hafsa wants to ask why is the apex of cochlea involved first, and the secular part, and not the basal turn of cochlea? I honestly do not have an explanation, but as was explained to me, that if the pressure increases in the cochlea, as you go towards the apical part, perhaps the thickness of the wall tends to become marginally thinner. So that's the part that gives way first. This is an explanation that was given to me. I really have no explanation. Maybe Anirban or Anita could tell us a little more on that. Okay, I'll, I'll just unmute Anita, ma'am, also. <laughs> but so it is well known more. that no tone hearing loss appears first in many years. Yeah. yeah. So, regarding that, the change of pure tone audiometry, sir, Dr. Mayank really would be happy if you could, you know, just once again tell us the way the PTA changes gradually. So, which frequency is first and then followed, followed by? Yeah, we, we usually see the low frequency is going first, so it's a rising curve. You know, usually any sensory neural deafness. It's a drop in curve because the high frequencies go first, whether it's noise induced or whatever, autotoxicity. But it, in many years, you have a low frequency loss, which appears first. Over a period of time, then it shifts to the high frequencies as well. And in later cases, in many years disease, the basal turn also then gives more damage. So the high frequencies drop further when you have the patient having repeated attacks, which go on over years together. Okay. Uh, then Dr. Hafsa also asked, why do we see recruitment phenomena in meniere? It's just because it's a cochlear loss? Yeah, because it's a cochlear loss, yes. We know that cochlear deafness gives recruitment and a simple test like the CC, if you're able to do it properly, you'll find it uh, positive. Yeah. And we used and to decompress them with our uh, uh, glycerol test. We even published on glycerol test. And uh, sometimes in the glycerol test, you may not get much pure tone improvement, but if you do speech audiometry, you find that you may get improvement in the speech discrimination scores with the glycerol test. You still do glycerol testing, sir? No, I don't. It's very uncomfortable for the patient. Yeah. And and Dhruv wants to ask the difference between Meniere's disease and Meniere's syndrome. Like we said, Meniere's disease is when you have this syndrome complex, the symptom complex, which is idiopathic where you can't find any other cause. Well, if you have it because of trauma, if you have it post-infection, if you have it because of autoimmunity, when there is a cause for the high drops, it's still got the same syndrome. The many years disease pattern is there, but because you have a cause for it, you don't call it many years disease because many years disease by definition is idiopathic high drops. Okay. okay, and now quite a few of them were really happy to way the way you explained the pathogenesis for vertigo and tinnitus. But if you could just repeat it, I mean, they really want to hear that again. So, no, look, maybe just one. you know. What happens when you move your head? The endolymph moves, it produces a current which leads to the bending of the hair cells of the stereocilia gynocilia, right? Now, the bending of the stereocilia is an impulse being sent to the brain that there is movement occurring, that there is fluid movement occurring, which means the head is moving. If the pressure goes up and it presses on the stereocilia and bends them, the brain doesn't understand that the stereocilia are bending because of pressure. Bending of the stereocilia is interpreted by the brain that there is movement. So that is why the patient has episodes of vertigo when the pressure goes up. Whatever homeostatic me mechanism that the body has of reducing the pressure and ending the attack, the pressure comes to normal. The hair cells are no longer bending, so the vertigo stops. Similarly, when the pressure in the cochlea goes up, the, bend, you see, so the hair cells can't function at the same uh, sort of uh, facility that they were doing, with the same efficiency that they were doing. 
So there is an apparent drop, a temporary drop in hearing. When the pressure goes away, the hair cells can function better. The hearing tends to improve. But with every subsequent attack, some amount of residual damage of the hair cells is left behind. So the hearing loss gradually progresses. Okay. okay. I think that should be pretty clear now, sir. Okay. Now coming to the signs and symptoms and the classification part, sir. Uh, Dr. Yeah. Sabri is asking, drop attack a differential diagnosis for cataplexy. Yeah, cataplexy is one, but usually in that there is a there are issues of consciousness. Yeah. In many of these, you will find that the patient is totally, totally aware of what yeah. is happening. Yeah. Okay. Now, Dr. Pushkaraj is asking: Can we say the Lerome syndrome is type two Meniere's disease? Type two. I, I did not in my reading come across type two. Lermois was given as a variant if somebody calls that variant as a type 2 okay but basically okay. it's a variant where instead of the hearing dropping and then the attack coming for some strange reason the hearing becomes very sharp the patient says my hearing becomes acute it may be the effect of uh, recruitment and at the peak of his hearing then the attack comes so if somebody calls it type 2 but in my reading i didn't really come across that terminology maybe if he has a reference he can share it with us perfect enough now, when you come to the references, sir, there is this one person, Anubhav Singh, and he has been asking us good questions all through the various previous talks. And he mentions that recently in a 2015 paper, the classification for Meniere's has been revised and probably accepted by AOHNS. And where he says it is now only definite and probable which exists, and they have deleted the possible and the certain Meniere's disease. I said I'll have to really. Yeah, this is again, this is all, this is terminology because. What the AONH yeah. in 1995 said, if you want to be absolutely certain it was high dose, you got to show it. Prove that it was high yeah. dose. What he's referring okay, to probably is this paper by Magnan, 2015. Yeah. This is like European white paper. Okay. But yeah. then again, as I said, you can, the, the possible, probable, etc. If a patient comes to you with a classical episode of vertigo, he hasn't still developed a hearing loss, but the the picture is fitting classically into the vertigo attacks of many years. I would say, you know, I'm keeping it at the back of my mind that this could be many years and I'll follow him up. And maybe sometime later, the vertigo, the uh, hearing loss will appear. So I would, in my terminology, say it's a possible many years. Disease. This was the okay. American Academy 1995 uh, thing that I put over. The paper that he's okay. probably referring to is the huge uh, paper of the European uh, Association. Jack Bagnan was the one who was heading that. Nice. Okay, now coming to the treatment part, sir. Now, Dr. Nisha and Dr. Poonam have asked, is there a role of Miniat's device? Yeah, I, I had the slide somewhere. I don't know why it didn't come, I think. Uh, I honestly feel that uh, how it is going to have a long-term effect, whatever pressure changes you make, like your dextromethasone on injection, would only have a temporary effect on the lab and how would it completely reverse the pathology? That's what I've not understood. I personally have no experience of the miniature, so that's why I've not mentioned it. If uh, uh, Anirban or Anjita have used it, maybe they can uh, yeah, put in their input here. Uh, sir, okay. can I add something? Just uh, recently, the uh, am I audible? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so just recently, the American Academy has come with a clinical practice guideline and uh, they say that they would actually now recommend against minute device. They feel that it has yeah. no role in uh, Meniere's disease. So they have actually uh, now yeah, category. I yeah, I didn't get onto it because some of the other it didn't appeal to me. You know, like the balloon yeah. sinoplasty for anything and everything. Uh, <laughs> it's something which we were not willing to accept. I, I did yeah, not really yeah. particularly see the principle behind it. So I never got on to do it yet. Do it, yeah. Okay. Similarly, like many, it's Dr. Raghav Mehta is asking if there is any role of vestibular implants. And he also asks, does decompression solve the etiology until what time do we have to keep the shunt inside? Oh, the shunt is a permanent shunt. You don't go and take it out. Okay. And yeah, any role I, of Aaron, vestibular there was, a, there was a shunt uh, by Arenberg. He's to sort of had a valvular shunt which allowed flow only from the endolymph into the uh, CSF. But... Uh, I, that's why I showed you that paper of uh, Mirko Toss and uh, these people. I'm sorry, your battery is low. You need to connect your laptop. Uh, low, yeah. 
हेलो लेट मी जस्ट कॉल एम अपज वी हैव क्वाइट अ फ्यू क्वेश्चन इन द ट्रीटमेंट Munish also asked him, which people have not asked about is uh, he has talked about caffeine. Uh, would he talk about the fluid? What does he? What is his fluid restriction? Is fluid giving fluids uh, for chronic uh, management? There is a big confusion. Yeah. So whether you restrict the fluid, yeah, or whether you give more fluid for the uh, chronic management. like for the prevention yeah many people are definitely asking about schedule oh all of us gen is not available i'm trying to call him in and it's saying he's not available who are called that he has come to my available ah let me try something else yeah sir is calling me yes sir what happened yeah. to your laptop hello hello yeah your laptop actually seems to have died down put him on a speaker okay we are waiting for you or do you want to reply on the speaker okay we'll wait for a minute then. right he saying he'll be back in a minute so let me see if yeah by the time anirban sir or anita ma'am can log in anita ma'am is here yeah yeah Do if we can ask you yeah if you could unmute anybody did you unmute anita ma'am no no i just unmuted anirban sir let me call anirban are you there hello yeah call him up i'll call anirban sir let me go sir can you yeah can you repeat we can't hear you you need to just unmute your mic i have unmuted you from my side you just need to unmute and then yeah and then we can you know we might have a few views from your side yes yeah, sir is online now kitne sir oh sir ka i think on ho raha hai because the battery was low kitne yeah. sir is yeah. online yeah sir are you there can you hear us Yeah. Yeah, I can hear you. Now, have you? Can you can you unmute yourself? Yeah, how is it? Yeah, yeah. I think you can. Up and up. Yeah, sir. Yeah. Okay. 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 Okay, Manish. Can this is Anil. Yes, sir. See, first, a few words. Okay, uh, Manish. First, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity of primarily paying my regards to Kirtan sir. It is for him where all of us have reached in Vertigo in India is just because of sir. Anyway, now getting back to our experiences with Meniere's disease. See, in our clinic, whenever we diagnose Meniere's disease. we do it only on the basis of not only the low frequency sensory neural hearing loss but also a positive ecog and a positive glycerol test in all suspected patients of meniere's disease we do a definite uh, we are always sure that we do a glycerol test as well as the ecog and in most of them both are positive or at least the ecog g or glycerol test is 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 positive so that is how we diagnose it that is the one part of the diagnosis coming to the history taking part we take a detailed history on migraine related things also like whether there is any history of motion sickness whether there is any family history of migraine because now it is believed that meniere's disease and migraine have the same origin and so if there is evidence of a migraine diathesis we always add a anti migraine drug like topiramate or divalproic sodium or something like that 
number three, number third thing is coming to the treatment part. Uh, it has been shown in, by in that Cochrane review that we, uh, diuretics do not work. It is not that it has been shown that diuretics do not work. It has been shown in the Cochrane review that there is no good evidence to show that the diuretics work. But regarding the use of beta histine, the Cochrane review 2009 and later on 2013 also says the same thing that there is no evidence, no good evidence to suggest that beta histine works in miniature disease. So that is another part of the issue. So whenever in our clinic, when we treat these patients of miniature uh, disease, and if we have to give prophylactic treatment, we usually use diuretics and practically very seldom or practically never at all do we use beta histine. We use mainly diuretics, not that the beta histine does not work, but beta histine works only at very high doses. And now there is a publication done by um, uh, done by uh, this French group who have shown that adding a salt with beta histine, you can reduce the dose of beta histine, some selenium or something, I've forgotten the name. It begins with S. By adding that to beta histine, you can get much better uh, uh, effect of beta histine, the same as you would have got by using beta histine at, say, more than 600 milligram. Uh, the same you can achieve with 8 or 16 milligram by adding that salt of selenium or something is the is the name so we have to think about if we use beta histine then we have to use it at very high dosage which is not possible right now and so we would like to stick to um, uh, the diuretics as of now there are studies which have shown that up to 144 milligram it is not of much use okay thank you thank you sir thanks thanks a lot Sir, Kirtana, sir, we can't hear you. Is sir audible? Not to me. So, sir has to, I think, uh, go to his microphone. Uh, go off, Oga. Sir, I'm going to go to Please mute my microphone also. Yes, sir. I'll just uh, Anirban, sir, uh, just one question to you. Hello? Yeah, tell me. Yes, tell me. Uh, uh, what is your opinion regarding fluid restriction? in the uh, four years it do you suggest it has that? it has been shown fluid restriction does not have significant effect so there is no question oh. of unnecessarily re restricting fluids and even salt restriction nowadays is not much advocated because salt restriction has been found that by restricting salt you are not lowering the sodium chloride level in in the inner ear fluids so those studies are there which have shown that. But still now, we believe that um, since diuretics work, why shouldn't salt restriction work? So that is the logic. But it has not been shown to be effective. Okay, sir. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Kirtana, sir, can you don't seem to be audible. Pranti, can you hear, sir? I can't hear, sir. No, I can't hear. I can't hear, sir. Sir, the microphone is kuch kahi se kuch mute. Hai. Mute, unmute. Sir, is yeah. No, just now, sir, it. should be okay. Sir, we can't hear you. 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 Sir, Phone karo, sir. Ko. Yeah, yes, sir. And you could unmute Anita, ma'am. Meanwhile, I have unmuted. Sir, I'm trying to call you. Sir, any phone? Yeah, but we can't hear you. Uh, maybe what you can do is you can leave the meeting and then join again. Because we can't hear you at all, there. So. Yeah. Yeah, but we can't hear you at all. Nobody is able to hear you. Now there are two. Two. No, no Kranti can't. Sir. 
no 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 twenty yeah. can't hear you sir twenty can't hear you sir what we'll do is now there are two ways one is I can put you on speaker phone because my network is working out fine so you can answer from here in the meantime you can just log out and log in again so you know we save time on that right so I'm putting you on speaker sir are you able to hear me sir क्रांति मेरी आवाज आ रही है सर की आवाज आ रही है मेरे स्पीकर फोन से क्रांति सर बहुत कम है सर एक बार लॉग आउट करके लॉग इन करिए दूसरी क्वेश्चन जो बार बार रिपीट हो रहा है रिगार्डिंग द डोसेज एंड फ्रीक्वेंसी Good evening, Anita, ma'am. Can you hear us? And if you can speak out. Hello, Anita, ma'am. Let me call her up. Okay, or call her. But I go. Who can really reply? These are tricky questions out here. <coughs> Hello. Hello. यहाँ भी आवाज नहीं आ रही है मैंने शायद मेरे लैपटॉप मैंने शायद मोबाइल से लॉग इन करा हुआ है ओके दैट विल बी स्लाइटली डिफिकल्ट फॉर हर हेलो कैन यू हेयर मी मैम या सो अगर आप सुन पा देयर इज नो को अनम्यूट आई विल लेट्स एक्चुअली लेट्स 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 ट्राई आंसरिंग जो हम कर सकते हो बाय द टाइम देयर इज देयर आर क्वेश्चन So there is a drug which is seen. Uh, I also remember that. So is the drug which he was talking about. Vikram Khanna sir has Khanna has replied. Five milligram. Yeah, please thank you. Thank you. Okay, ma'am. Anita, ma'am is coming in. So, so for those who don't know Anita Bhandari, ma'am, she is from Jaipur. So that's my city, and she is doing a huge work in water. She has made some new equipments. And that's where Jaya. Anita, ma'am, can you hear us? Okay, I think you two. She can hear us, but uh, she is not. Anjali, ma'am. Yes. Uh, yeah, you can because after we have unmuted you, so you can talk through the phone. On. The... Usme. उसमें सिर्फ आपको कनेक्ट करना पड़ेगा थ्रू द डिवाइस ऑडियो उस पे बस क्लिक करना पड़ेगा बस एंड देन यू विल बी एबल टू जस्ट टेल इट ऑन अ डिवाइस ऑडियो वेदर इट्स मोबाइल और कंप्यूटर आई विल जस्ट सो आफ्टर टॉकिंग टू अनिर्बन सर देयर इज अ बिग कंफ्यूजन नाउ दैट वेदर बीटा एस्टिन देना चाहिए कि नहीं देना चाहिए ह्यूज कंट्रोवर्सी रिगार्डिंग द ट्रीटमेंट नॉट लेट मी सी ओके सो 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 Yes, ma'am. No, it's already been done. Yeah. Send a new picture. Let me try. Are you able to hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Let us ask the audience whether they can listen to ma'am. The audience can hear you. Then it's okay. Because there are lots and lots of questions. Can anybody hear in the ma'am? Can you just say something? Am I audible now? Okay, you are pretty much audible. Okay, ma'am. Let me let me just ask, start with of a few questions. What is the regimen of intratympanic gentamicin that you prefer? How is the regimen of intratympanic gentamicin that you are in? Hello. Yeah. You are very no more. That is not uh, not working. That's not working out. So we need okay, to not... have them computer audio. Yeah, we need to have a computer audio. 
मैम एक काम करो ना अनिका मैम एक बार उसमें आप ट्राई करो मैंने आपको पूरी आपका पूरी तरह ग्रीन दिखा रहा है सो वी शुड बी एबल टू हियर यू या ओके सो लेट्स लेट्स ट्राई आंसर लेट्स अनम्यूट आउट कमिंग बट अ फ्यू ऑफ देम वी कैन आंसर हां है ही इज देयर बिकॉज़ ही इज राइटिंग नॉट हियरिंग अनिता Anirban sir, uh, yeah, Anirban just sir. just unmute. Well done, Anirban sir. We need your oh, help. Yeah. Or anybody of the three, otherwise, sir, we have to answer. Karna padega, which they might not like. <laughs> <laughs> Vikram Khanna is there. Yeah, Vikram is there. Oh, I know. Vikram yeah, he's been answering so many things. Yeah. Yes. Yes, sir. Unmute Vikram. Aha. Yes. Yes, Manish. Oh, yeah. Tell me if. Yes, yes, yes. Tell uh, me. So, uh, Anirban sir, just uh, could you clarify regarding your regimen for uh, intratympanic dexamethasone or intratympanic gentamicin as to uh, how how much dosage you give at what intervals and till how long? Intratympanic dexamethasone. I think or I have used two two three times only, not more than that. when i had suspected that there could be a autoimmune origin other than that i have never used i think only on two occasions i had used intratympanic dexamethasone but intratympanic gentamicin we use say once in about 4 5 6 months we use intratympanic gentamicin but intratympanic mm -hmm. gentamicin what we do is that 0.7 ml of that gentamicin which is available at 40 mg per ml it comes so in 0.7 you have about 28 mg to that we add about 0.3 cc of sodium bicarbonate then it becomes easier that is i do not know why but then that i had learned from dr alok thakkar so that is how we mix it and then we inject as sir said we put make first one hole one puncture and then Uh, 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 from the posterior part, we inject the um, intratympanic gentamicin, and in one ml, it usually fills up the entire thing. And more than that, you don't require. Sometimes a little more. I, we do it till the time it starts leaking from the puncture in the anterior segment. That goes for intratympanic gentamicin. And what about the intratympanic dexamethasone, sir? So intratympanic dexamethasone, we use dexamethasone only, uh, and uh, I think it was we, what we were using. I think 20 milligram dissolved in a little bit of normal saline, and then injecting can you, can you it. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Can you hear yeah, me now? Yes, sir. Very, yes, sir. Very much. We can oh, hear you. Yeah. Oh. So I, know, I wanted to talk about what Anirban said. As I said. we started with the glycerol test i have never had the access to electrococleography but that was one investigation which people were doing it for uh, diagnosing many years with uh, the glycerol sometimes we had patients complaining of severe headache after the test and that's why we stopped doing it usually on the clinical basis we are able to come to a conclusion then as regards beta histin there are two completely divided camps the americans don't believe it the recommendation that i gave you about 48 bd has come from the paper that these are the european recommendations for preventive treatment 48 bd we had done a trial i think way back i think in the 80s sometime where we had done a uh, perfusion of the posterior cranial fossa before and i mean with and without uh, beta histine and our uh, nuclear medicine guy clearly showed us that the perfusion had improved probably because of the effect on the h3 receptors so there it is some vasodilatory effect definitely clinically as an impression i feel that my patients with many years when i do 24 or 48 twice daily usually i give them 24 twice but 48 twice daily also whether it's placebo or what i don't know but they seem to benefit and uh, therefore i continue to give it salt restriction i really don't know but if the patient has associated hypertension is automatically on salt restriction one thing that they said there is no good evidence this is through that cochrane review from uh, kunda et al they said there is no clear evidence that diuretics work so i would not be bold enough to say that 
you know, diuretics works, that's why I give them. Sometimes with the diuretics, if they don't take associated potassium with that, they come back with this tingling, numbness, and they get scared what has happened to them. So you have to tell them in advance that you take potassium replacement. As I said, why does the treatment of some type work in some patients and not in the others? We may be dealing with different pathologies, which we are at the moment just assuming to be high drops. But maybe what we are diagnosing as high drops every time may not be high drops. And that's why the same treatment does not seem to work uniformly. As regards the uh, tympanic gentamicin, I use it much more often. Decadron I almost uh, never use. I've used it more for sudden sense in neural hearing loss. But intratympanic gentamicin uh, has given me some very good results in people with intractable vertigo and patients with drop attacks. I would use it. I would wait for about three weeks to a month. I can even do a caloric test to find out whether I have sufficiently reduced the sensitivity or not. But if the patient says that he's still a little uncomfortable, after about a month, I repeat the injection. There's one patient where I've done the injection thrice. But otherwise, with one or two injections, most of the patients have remained quite stable. But as I said, I hesitate to destroy somebody's uh, lab enzymes. Yeah. Okay, sir. Now, when you talk about this, Dr. Simab Sheikh is actually thanked you for his lect for your lecture. But he also asks, did you did, can you really you know give an amount of time that we should wait between the first and the second line management before we go ahead with the intratympanic and then the fourth line? Is there it all depends upon line? the it, it depends upon the patient's feedback. It's the patient who drives you to say, Doc, I'm not feeling better, do something. So I won't say three weeks, six weeks, but I think I would try my conservative treatment at least for three months before I say, no, I think I want to go to something else. Okay, sir. Three to four months. Dr. Ramesh uh, Rohiwan is asking. Yeah, Randy. Just one thing. Uh, when So when you are talking about gentamicin injections, uh, there are sometimes patients who come to us with not such a bad hearing loss, but what is really bad. Uh, and then do you prefer giving a, a steroid shot first and then, you know, because gentamicin could be um, having a, uh, having issues with ototoxicity. So would you prefer to give dexamethasone as first and then uh, patients, you would have a cutoff that after this gentamicin? Is it, uh, there is a confusion think, regarding this also. No, I think, Kranti, that's a very good point because when a patient is fairly good hearing, you're a little hesitant. And uh, yes, very you, could, you, could, you could give the DEXA. The literature shows that the DEXA has a fairly limited length of effect because once the DEXA is washed out of the system, of the labyrinthine system, maybe two weeks, three weeks, six weeks, whatever, after that, the effect of the DEXA is gone. So how long are you going to keep on giving it is the question. So I have given yeah. that as a desperate measure for the sake that the hearing was so good, I don't want to destroy it. Also, if I give two or three shots of DEXA and the patient doesn't improve, then I can tell the patient, look, we've tried this, and now the option for you is to go for this with the risk that you may lose some hearing. If you're okay with that, I would take a written consent and then give the gentamicin injection. Yes, thank, thank you, sir. This was a very important uh, yeah. yeah, that's been asked by a few people also. Sir, now Dr. Ramesh Royiwal is asking, is there a role of VEM in to check the progression after giving the in injectable therapy? Yeah, that's what I said. I think he missed out probably on that. That the main use now of VEM most people are doing is instead of trying to do a caloric test, you know, formally what they used to do, they would give the injection, do a caloric test next day. Hmm. And no, the next day give an injection. Again, do the caloric test. So I think we need to wait for some time, maybe up to three to four weeks, Instead of doing a caloric test, you can check with the VEMP. That today, the VEMP is used more for autolytic function after gentamicin injection to see whether you're getting the desired effect or not. Yeah. And, and for the similar thing, Nikhil is asking, do you when do you do your audiometry test for these patients? When, when they present to us. Oh, I mean, after, the, uh, oh, after the injection. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When yeah. he comes for the follow-up after three weeks, four, whenever he comes for the follow-up, I would do an audio. So you don't do it in between to really check if he's not losing his hearing. <laughs> if he's, I mean, he will complain to you if he feels. We tell him that if you feel the hearing is dropping, complain to us. Then I would start no, him on oral steroid. No, I would start okay. him on oral steroids. Yeah. Okay. If, if he says that the hearing is. Yeah. Okay. Deepak Galmeh is asking: Is it right to give cinerazine and beta histone together? 
which we see mm, commonly being advised. That's uh, you know, sinarizine usually when I use it, I use it for a short term. It's it's when the patient is really uncomfortable because it has a, a definite labyrinthine sedative action. But if you have a patient who is asymptomatic, otherwise I would stop the sinarizine completely. I would still continue with the beta histine. So beta histine is the long haul horse. Uh, sinarizine is more for the acute symptoms. Okay, that's a good sign. Uh, Paramita is asking, she could have asked you earlier, I don't know why she's asking. But anyhow, she's asking what... what you know, she's locked up, there's no way... She is in Bombay, but she's at one end of the world and I'm at the other end. The lockdown, there is no communication. Yeah. So, so what should be the water intake for these kind of patients? What would be the? Water intake. Water In intake. No, no. If the patient doesn't have a renal problem, I don't think that's an issue. So no particular advice no. regarding restrictions? No. No. Right. no. 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 Also mentioned. Dr. Vijay Sagar is asking, what if you do a bilateral vestibular nerve section? Oh boy, you, you will cripple the patient. That poor guy won't be able to walk. Every time he bobs his head, the whole, whole periphery is going to move. Uh, his uh, adaptation exercises will have absolutely no effect because there'll be no input going to the vestibular nuclei. I, I don't think, and I have only had yeah. the misfortune of seeing one patient where a surgeon, believe me or not, has done, not at the same time, but a bilateral translabyrinthine cochleo vestibular neurectomy. So deaf in both ears, oh labyrinth's my. gone. Really. Oh and this was in the pre-cochlear implant days, so even couldn't restore the hearing with cochlear implants. Ah. Okay. Sir, Dr. Suresh yeah. M is asking any specific treatment for the Lero maze or the Tumarkin's crisis. No, I think Tumarkin's crisis, if it doesn't come under control, Laramois, I don't think there's a special treatment, but with the Tumarkin, if it doesn't come under control with the conservative treatment, then the dechentamicin injection would be... Because, you know, here the problem is, it's a, even if his hearing is not very bad, I would still think of it because he can hurt himself. He can damage himself yeah. with this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, Poonam Agrawal is asking, what is the sequence of clinical features? Sir? She has been asking it to many people, but they didn't get a proper answer. So, what's, is there it's, it's variable. Sequence? It's variable. It depends upon, you know, at times you, you can have the vestibular symptoms coming earlier and the deafness coming later. There are times when patients have only fluctuating deafness and you're wondering why, because there is no vertigo attack. Yeah, you tend to treat them with steroid things, it's autoimmune, but the autoimmune tests come negative. And the vertigo may make its appearance later. So these are things you don't understand, but the vertigo and deafness can have different relationships coming earlier, coming later, coming together. But if a patient is into the syndrome of about a year or so, then probably he will he will have both. Because if he continues yeah. to get vestibular attacks and the, the deafness doesn't develop, then it's not many years. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, sir, there are there are various people, including Dr. Vikram Khanna, who have asked vestibular migraine and meniere's disease. Meniere's so, disease. How you manage that? Yeah, I thought Anirban talked about that. that. There is a definite relationship now being assessed. So, if you found the classification of the five different types of uh, many years. We had one which was said many years and migraine or the migraineous variant of uh, vertigo. The treatment for the two would be treatment of the vertigo as well as treatment of the migraine. Okay. okay. Right. Yeah. Uh, uh, no. Yeah. You want to ask something? Uh, no, uh, just uh, one thing, sir, regarding, uh, uh, regarding the controversial diuretic. So as you were talking about Cochrane uh, review, there was one uh, discussion regarding the role of hydrochlorothiazide, which definitely, mm -hmm. so they, um, in, in the Cochrane, they actually concluded that they would require further studies to prove whether hydrochlorothiazide is actually because uh, uh, the place where I did my attachment for a while and it was pretty commonly given in all the patients for because obviously in america you do not use beta histine so mm. hydrochloride was a very very common modality of treatment for chronic uh, prevention of uh, many years and they used to give it for 25 milligram reaching up to 50 milligram a day and either it would be bd dose or hydrochlorothiazide was a very common uh, treatment modality um, as we use beta histine here 
and uh, they use hydrochlorothiazide. So okay. that actually confuses uh, um, you know, these Cochrane reviews, as many studies, as many <laughs> reviews. And you know, this is that the, the difficulty comes in because there are so many publications, but there are different levels of reliability in these publications. Yeah. So you really have yeah, to have something, a, a study which is done, you know, fitting into all the criteria to say, okay, these results are acceptable. Somebody talking about just yeah. a few cases or a study not done, uh, it's difficult to. So, as I said, right in the beginning when I started my lecture, it's one of the worst problems to have because you have big history, clinical findings which don't contribute much. The outcome of your testing is very confusing. The treatments are so varied and everybody keeps 66.6% uh, benefit. So are we dealing with one same pathology or are we having different pathologies manifesting with the similar symptoms? And I, I think uh, that is where we are going because the same treatment doesn't seem to work. As far as I'm concerned, I use beta histine and, and hydrochlorothiazide both. But the hydrochlorothiazide yeah. for a lesser period of time, the beta histine I give for six months. Believe me, the patient says, sir, when I reduce my beta histine, I, I tend to get attacks again. I said, fine, take it for a year because I haven't seen too many side effects. Since it doesn't act on the H2 receptors, bronchial asthma, acidity, these symptoms are not very uh, not really very seen. Yeah, so I can give it for a longer time as long as they're not getting it. And sometimes I think it may be a placebo effect. He's so dependent on that, that he's happy taking it. And if he's happy taking it, I'm happy to give it to him. Okay, so now a few more questions before we end this. Dr. Pushkaraj is asking, what is the role of CHAMP in diagnosis of Meniere's disease? No experience at all, so. Uh, Dr. Anil Bhatt, to answer, and, please. I would. I don't know whether he's still around. Let me unmute him. But uh, sir, he's also asking the uh, role of saculotomy in the treatment. Yeah, I personally have done saculotomies in the past, and uh, although it was said that the saculotomy, uh, this was something that was described by Shuknik. It was a cochlear saculostomy that you went through the round window, and you punctured the sacul, hoping to establish when you go in through the osseous spiral lamina hoping to establish an endolymph perilymph shunt so that every time the endolymphatic pressure built up, it would drain into the perilymph, which has a much bigger uh, volume. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Did get some relief initially, but whether it was really uh, required or not, I don't know. But I did get a drop in the high frequencies in these cases. Okay, So okay. it is not something that is does not give uh, uh, hearing loss. And the outcomes were not really great. They were short-lived. So I think maybe you're creating a shunt, but the shunt closes down. I have done eight okay. cases of saculotomy. Sir, another interesting question here is, I think that's pretty explainable, but these people want to know, what is the pathogenesis behind Hennebert sign? Okay. That is, that is having a fistula sign positive without an actual fistula. It's when you have the third window effect. So if you have... A, a very it is said that in luetic affection of the inner ear where you have a very flaccid foot plate that the foot plate moves in and out that's hennebert sign was classically described for luetic labyrinthitis yeah. okay yeah. but if, if you have a third window syndrome if you have a superior semicircular canal or if the entity of a, a very large cochlear aqueduct is present then you could get a hennebert sign but luetic mm -hmm. um, uh, labyrinthitis and uh, superior semicircular canal dehiscence, Lloyd Miner's uh, disease. I think these are where you have the third window effect, and is the third window effect that gives rise to the Hennebert sign. Okay. And now uh, Vishal is asking the role of potassium. You know, when you give potassium, pot chlor syrup or something, do you think there is any? Now, you give pot chlor because when you're giving a diuretic, uh, you're depleting not only the sodium but also the potassium. And the patients tend to get some amount of tingling uh, numbness, which you can offset by giving potassium. It's a horrible tasting thing, the pot chlor. Yeah. So you can give them coconut water, mosambi juice, you know, sweet, sweet lime juice. Uh, these are rich in uh, potassium. So coconut water people accept much more easily. Yeah, so it's only when you're giving a diuretic which leads to potassium loss, you need to add potassium. 
Well, okay. I had come across one one paper which said that if you give sufficiently a dose of potassium, it may actually reduce the sodium levels. But I don't know whether that really holds true or not. I had come across that somewhere. I don't remember where. Now. So okay. using potassium now, to reduce the sodium levels. Okay. Now, yeah, now various ahead. people have been asking this. And let me suggest it's off the topic, but still, what do you give for treatment of vestibular migraines? Sibelium or topiramate, and for how long? Yeah, I usually would try off with Sibelium first. You can also give a, a beta blocker. But uh, Sibelium, as a matter of fact, uh, instead of 10 milligrams, you could start with just 5 milligrams and see if it works. If not, then step up to 10 milligrams. But otherwise, if I find a patient resistance, I say go to the neurologist. <laughs> so, sir, what I understand you know, these you are, don't these are very, these are very high strung patients. Yeah. You don't really believe in diuretics, right? So that's no. That's if, if my patient comes to me with you know cluster attack, you know that many years disease tend to come in cluster attacks. That the patient may yeah. have no attacks for six months, and then within one week he'll get two or three attacks. So that is the time I also give diuretics along with the beta ester and potassium. But I don't so want to continue long term. Long term, I don't okay, give. So long term, the yeah. Sorry, yeah? sorry. Go ahead, sir. So long term, I don't give it. But if a patient has come to me with cluster attacks, I would give it to yeah. OK. Now, if you're giving a diuretic, Anupam wants to know whether you would like to use a thiazide or a chlorothalidone. Which which diuretic do you use? No, no. I, I, I'm using uh, hydrochlorothiazide. Hydrochlorothiazide. That is now, some of them, you have those spironolactones, et cetera, which, has, which are potassium uh, sparing. So one could use that. But I think Sparing. most commonly, yeah. OK. So now there is a question for you from Anirban Biswas, sir. And he's asking, is it a vestibular suppressant or a stimulant as the market marketers of the drug promote it as a stimulant, whereas published articles show it to be a suppressant? Which one? Which beta drug? Histine. Beta histine. No, as I think beta histine, the main use, the rationale for my use of beta histine is for its histamine release action in the inner ear and at the blood brain matter, so you have improvement of blood circulation. My main use is for that. I don't think it's a suppressant or a stimulant. I think it is something that improves the blood circulation in the area, the target area, and that is why you're using it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. There were some, there were some articles about showing that it... without producing a peripheral vasodilatation, it produces vasodilatation where you want it. I, I have patients who come and tell me, doctor, when I get an attack of vertigo, I pop one uh, vertin eight and my vertigo goes away. I said, good, if that's working for you, continue. But I don't think it has a, any suppressant or a stimulant action. Vasodilatation is what I use it for. OK. OK. Now, when uh, so people are asking about diuretics, if you would like to use acetazolamide, but I think you already said you prefer hydrochlorothiazide. Well, he has already answered that. Yeah. And Dr. Ramesh Raiwal is asking if the role of titration, role of titration doses of injection histamine. Considering beta we, used to, we used to that before we got on, we, we got the product of Vertin. We used to have a histamine drip, both for sudden sense in the neural hearing loss or intractable vertigo. And you sort of titrate it, keep on increasing the drop rate till the patient complains of a headache and you just come down below that rate. But keep monitoring the blood pressure because if you give too much histamine, the blood pressure can suddenly drop. But uh, yeah. I think with beta histine, now we don't no longer do that. It was more used for sudden sensory neural hearing loss than for many instances. Okay. And I think the most controversial thing is when Anthony Paulos is asking is, I remember Michael Stroop saying beta histine is the coroner's of cornerstone and he was suggesting up to 200 milligrams per day and mm -hmm. so i told him let's not get into all this so if you, you know right now i'm this, sitting uh, right now i'm sitting in a circular room so i can't see any corner so each each one has their own fixed ideas stroop yeah. wants to give uh, 200 600 whatever anirvan doesn't want to give any i'm so middle of the road kind of thing Okay, so before we end, oh, people have been asking again about hydrochlorothiazide. What's Kranti, you want to say something? No, I just wanted to say that as long as it's working for the patient, that's what is also important. 
you know i think in medicine there is one very simple principle let's face it yeah he who cures is right <laughs> if the patient comes by saying i am feeling better whether to my rational it appeals or not as long as i'm not harming the patient with that drug if i'm not having toxic side effects if he's feeling better i'm happy to give it to him because i as yeah. i started my lecture by saying this whole the whole disease is extremely vague and we are all shooting in the dark if you find something that works for a particular patient and it doesn't harm him in any way okay if he if he's okay with it continue okay sir now just what is the duration of hydrochlorothiazide that you use people just want to know for that six weeks. Six, six weeks six weeks okay i think that's good enough sir we we have almost tried to cover up as much as we could okay last one question is dr sunaya is asking how do we manage meniere's disease with bilateral snhl due to autoimmune disease Yeah, you you have to start treating the autoimmune disease. You'll have to get the immunologist treatment and whatever treatment, whether it's steroids, methotrexate, whatever they want, because the autoimmune disease is going to cause him more harm than his many years. So the treatment has to be directed towards the autoimmune disease. Okay. Uh, if you're okay. closing now, Monish, two things. Yeah, two things I want to know: that how many yes, people did we have, and how many fell off to sleep? <laughs> we had four attending. Four hundred. And it's been awesome. Right? anybody must be sleeping despite the topic being so that they might have felt dizzy but i am sure everybody enjoyed sir and i thought they were majority post graduates when we started off it but you know as i mentioned the names of people i was astonished to hear i'm not really surprised enough because everybody would love to hear you so we had let me just name a few kalyani man ke ma'am prakash munga sir anjuman biswas sir anita bhandari ma'am dr ahila swami गिरीश मिश्रा सर माधुरी मेहता मैम नीलम वैद मैम सीमा शेख श्याम सोमानी विक्रम खन्ना विक्रांत माथुर रूपाली जैन नवनीत माथुर राघव मेहता सो दीज आर जस्ट अ फ्यू नेम्स हु आर वेरी सीनियर डूइंग वेरी गुड वर्क्स एंड दे वर ऑल हियर सो आई एम वेरी हैप्पी यू नो आई एम ग्लैड यू डिडंट टेल मी दिस इन एडवांस आई एम ग्लैड यू डिडंट टेल मी इन एडवांस बिकॉज़ आई वुड बी अदरवाइज शिवरिंग एंड शेकिंग यू दीस गाइस लिसनिंग टू मी आई वुड Dr. Anirban Viswas is mentioning that he is still here, and he's saying all of us are all still here. All of us are here. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's amazing. Or oh, Pankaj Kumar is saying we are we are hearing you again after three years. So yeah, just to hear you, I think. No, but I think Anirban. Anirban, I'm glad he came, but I have to say that we're really proud of the work that he's doing. He's really really an international master. So is Anita. so compliments to them they have taken it to a different level and more importantly what i love these guys for is they are training so many people is doing workshops and training so many people i believe truly knowledge is not knowledge unless it's shared monish that's why you are doing karthik you're doing a fantastic job by sharing this compliments thank to you, you thank you thank you uh, just to mention what is it as our privilege yeah yeah our privilege monish that you are here today to be and be a part of this update program and i think in when lockdown monish, one of them, when monish yeah when monish says something i never say no to him he knows i know that, that. <laughs> so yeah they yeah. and, <laughs> and one of the okay. things was that this was the best webinar we attended in lockdown so i just missed that but this was really nice so uh, just okay. to end the Deepak Dalmia sir is actually thanking you and as is Seema Sheikh saying Paramita wants a special mention that she is here too and uh, uh, just to end Deepak Dalmia sir is saying if you could really talk on remaining causes of peripheral vertigo so sir sir does have a talk on BPPV coming up next Saturday and we would be that would be probably be shared in various platforms and hopefully we would also share us with our post graduates who are going to be here. that true sir okay, and so bpp we next i'll send you the details i'll send you the details perfect sir thank Let you me so just okay. thank lk marais once again lk has been really helpful to you know propagate us this and provide us with this platform and thanks again sir i mean it is a privilege hearing you for everyone and for many of us who would probably not dream to reach you so easily many of these post graduates may aspire to be somebody like you so that's that's the biggest thing which could have happened thank you for saying that thank and you. thanks thank to alkem both their divisions are, are doing uh, very good work as far as uh, medical knowledge is concerned yeah
Okay. Thank you, sir. Bye, everybody. This we ended. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, sir. Thank you. All of you stay safe. And Moni, stay sensible and stay safe. Yeah. Yes, you, sir. Thank you, same. Uh, Moni, just before we end, there are people who are asking about the security issues of webinar in comparison to Zoom. So I'm just going to tell that this is an age-old, old, old uh, uh, webinar, uh, uh, you know, uh, portal, and it's pretty safe because of many other security issues which they already deal with. So no, no yeah, issues no, with the security. I don't think it's a Chinese app anyhow. So that makes me feel safer. <laughs> so, it's yeah. So, uh, that's okay thank, thank you okay. all thank you for thank you sir thank you very much and we will be sharing the link for enuka ma'am's talk I will. in a few yeah sir okay yeah. bye okay sir bye bye sir bye thank sir you, sir.